summarize once again what the focus of your entrepreneurship is, and then follow it up with what's exciting and what's challenging. Sure. So the focus of, of uh, our initiative in Excel Fera is to develop a way to grow stem cells to treat disease. Uh, we're starting out with treating leukemia. Uh, these cells can also make other types of blood cells, such as T cells and cells that can be used in immunotherapeutics. And, and the real challenge is, is to try to develop this new therapy and figure out models in which the Canadian healthcare system can adopt this therapy and, and make it provided to patients. So we're really excited about this. We, this is a company that we're building in Canada and we want to try to keep in Canada and, and uh, I'm hoping we're going to do that. What would you say is our biggest challenge? The biggest challenge? I mean, the biggest challenge has been um, to actually, so far, to keep it in Canada, to tell you the truth. Um, it's very easy to uh, uh, respond to investors who want to take the technology and bring it to the U.S. Actually, let's follow up on that, yeah. because we want you to stay in Canada. We actually want you to move to Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> but what can we do as a community to keep the company in Canada? Obviously, come up with a lot of money, right? No, I no? think, I, think you, I mean, that's part of it, but I think you really hit the nail on the head is what, what we need is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Part of what, um, what creates this, uh, this dynamic is having, being, having enough companies so people can move from one company to the next, create an expertise basis and, and have people the, uh, give people the opportunity to cut their teeth in one place and move to another place. And that really, you know, programs like Hatch, programs like the Mars Innovation Center and others are really helping to create that ecosystem within Canada. So I think it's exciting. So proliferate those, yes. sort of like uh, stem cells, and, yeah, and, and, and have more of them and larger ones, yes. and, and more robust funding. And yep. So the people out here can really help by actually working with the local university, wherever they are, to really to create those uh, maker spaces, those places where people with different ideas can really collide. And, and get support from serial entrepreneurs. I yes, guess. absolutely. No, absolutely. And I mean, the other aspect I think we need to really uh, work on is attracting anchor firms. So these are the, the large firms, you know, uh, the multinationals around which these small companies often cluster right. uh, to build. And I think I think the uh, uh, the opportunities in Canada to attract those companies are really great right now. Absolutely, with the, uh, the immigration yes. advantage and, and as well as uh, things that uh, can be provided by provincial and federal government in terms of tax incentives. So those are things that you think might be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the focus of our entrepreneurial program is pretty clear. Uh, we're hoping to develop better methods to detect cancer early, and I think that's also part of the excitement. I mean, it's, you know, um, it was very easy for everyone in the company to make that shift, to make that decision to tackle cancer once we realized we had an opportunity. I mean, what else really would we do? Um, the challenges are almost insurmountable, uh, partly technical. I mean, we're detecting 100 cancer mutations today. Uh, that'll cover eight or nine different cancers. Uh, to become more sensitive, we're actually developing a panel right now, and the architect of that is in the audience right there, um, of a two to 300 cancer mutations. But we also have technology in-house that's going to move us up to 100,000 cancer mutations uh, that we don't talk about publicly just yet. Um, but that's part of the challenge, it's technical, and the other challenges are, are reimbursement challenges, government challenges, um, making sure that we can make this cheap enough that it can be used across the country, um, and of course doing the clinical trials required uh, to get the data that doctors will need to see to, uh, to buy into this test. So there's a fair amount of money required for sure, uh, which you know, we're partnering on. So. Now that uh, visual was, was sort of a Positive control, right? What, the green and red, or was that was that real? Was uh, that it was real, real DNA, from, but from there was a lot more uh, than we would normally have in there for the sake of the I video, see. for sure. Normally, you couldn't see it. Yeah. So, can you multiplex in in, in this? We system? can, yeah. yeah. No, we're in in one sample. We are running uh, twelve patients and hundred mutations. Oh, I see. Okay. Which is which is how we're making it inexpensive. We're really hoping this is going to be a test. It's not thousands of dollars, but a hundred dollars. Gotcha. And if you actually go back to the patient, how early a stage can you detect? We can see uh, DNA in some patients all the way down to stage one. Wonderful. Well, I mean, it has to be. We have to catch it at stage one or two kind of earlier on. Understood. Thank you. So um, our focus is um, trying to 
put our technology in the context of a true revolution that's happening in ultrasound. Uh, like your iPhone that can compute now what a Cray could do 20 years ago. Uh, an ultrasound machine is shrinking rapidly. Uh, we'll have this in everyone's pocket and uh, uh, developing something that uh, uh, works well and has a good user interface uh, requires quite a bit of funding and uh, uh, we're looking at that. And our next challenge is uh, also uh, uh, trying to prove the technology uh, in, in patients and uh, uh, that also requires a fair bit of commitment and partners, uh, uh, medical partners and so on. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're developing a tool to measure the indicators of stress and anxiety in real time. And our first application is for children on the autism spectrum. I would say that the most challenging piece of that is really that each individual with autism is really unique. And uh, their behaviors are unique. And the way that they would use this technology is unique. And, and so we have to uh, be really focused in what we're doing, but also be able to be um, adaptable to all of these different situations um, while coming up with a, a plan to be able to scale um, basically how you measure emotion and, and stress uh, to a number of different disorders as well. So um, we, yeah, it's, it's challenging to be so individualized to create a technology that is different for every person, um, but is still unified in some way. So can you give us some sort of idea? It's a wearable device, mm. and I guess a third party remotely, the principal or someone else, a mother or father can, can detect um, early, early signs of anxiety, right? So how, tell me a little bit about how it would be the applications of, of the technology. Sure. So uh, to start, the wearable um, sends the information over Bluetooth to a parent or caregiver's phone. And they would see uh, the increasing levels of anxiety and be able to uh, know if they need to start a calm down routine with their child. Very often, these signs of anxiety um, are in subtle behavior cues. And if you're not watching the child all the time, um, then it's hard to notice these cues. Or if you're in, your, you're in a classroom when there are 20 other children, it's sometimes hard to notice. So if you can identify when that anxiety level is increasing, you can um, do something to help keep that child happier and healthier overall. Uh, but our goal is really to move into the self-regulation piece so the child will be able to get that feedback uh, themselves and know when to start their own calm down routine or know when they need to take a break or leave that situation. And then for the, for the adults on the autism spectrum as well, as I mentioned, 90% are unemployed or underemployed. Uh, to be able to better regulate and better understand their own emotions and know when that anxiety level is increasing can also help with that vocational training and, and keeping down a job. So it's a wearable device, so is not one concerned that, because I know of individuals who are autistic, that they would remove it and throw it away. Are you thinking about a second generation, which would be a, a, a patch or something like that, which is not bulky? And is that, is that something that's possible? Yeah, our goal is really to make it as unintrusive as possible. And our original plan was to, to use smart textiles and put it into clothing. But then um, that comes with another you know, variety of challenges. And so if we start with a, a wearable, it's our easiest way to get to market and kind of prove the technology. If we can move to a patch or into implantables or edibles, as I mentioned, then uh, we can kind of go with any, any um, system that measures these physiological indicators. So here's a top question that we've gotten from the audience. Uh, Andrea, I've noticed that you did not have a healthcare professional on your original team. How did you get that expertise? You know, uh, that's a really great question. None, um, the founding team, we were a bunch of undergrads, you know, kids on the street who really just came up with this idea. But the, the cool thing about the area that we're, that we're working in is that um, people really understand the problem and they can see how it can impact people in their daily lives and they want to help. Uh, we still get emails every day from um, experts, from healthcare professionals, from caregivers, parents, autistic individuals around the world 
who want to help in some way. We've had a parent from Fort St. John who wants to drive down to Vancouver to be part of our trial. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa just wait, <laughs> wait until we're a little bit further advanced. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing that there are so many people who want to, to contribute and uh, who want to, to join something that they know will have a big impact. So um, finding the right healthcare professional is, is a challenge. Um, you know, the person who has all the network, uh, but we've, we've uh, come across a number of them, which we're really fortunate to have. In terms of your patient recruitment, are you, thinking, are you talking just about Vancouver Metro, or what, what's your... For the, for the current study, yeah, Just it's, uh, Vancouver. it's from Vancouver to Chilliwack. We unfortunately limited our, um, our geographical uh, recruitment. Um, but for our future studies, we're looking at um, in different countries, actually. And we're, for our pilot study, we'll be in three different countries because that's where the resources are um, to, to uh, simulate the uh, education piece, the home piece, and, the, um, and various different settings. So. Um, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll be all over, but right now we're still in Metro Vancouver. Thank you, thank you. Next question is about Andre's blood test. <clears throat> I guess it's asking the question of the spectrum of mutations that, that uh, might lead to uh, transformation of the cell to a cancer phenotype. Um, what fraction of mutations do you think you have um, that you can actually genetically test for? Well, fraction is a hard number. There. <laughs> There's hundreds of thousands of possible cancer mutations, uh, and many of them are not known. And I think that's a real philosophical uh, question amongst those of us trying to do uh, circulating tumor DNA detection as to what do you go after. Um, we have a comp competing company in the U.S. that wants to go after all of them. And the problem I have with that is you might catch more cancers, but I'm certain you will also create more false alarms. And if you do the economic modeling, it's, you find out very quickly that if you tell someone they have cancer when they don't, more often than once in every thousand tests that you give, then you shouldn't be offering that test. Both, both on a personal level, but also on an economic level, because at that point you're spending a lot of money looking for something that's not there, um, and it, it's damaging all around. So our approach has been, to date, to actually get a relatively small number um, of mutations that are activating mutations, they're, they're driver mutations, for those of you that uh, don't know what that means. These are, these are mutations that are causing the cancer to become cancerous in the first place. It's not something that comes along later by accident or, or as a result of it being cancerous. Um, so we've really gone after the obvious ones, hoping to heat, you know, hit that level and that balance between sensitivity to detecting cancers and specificity that we will be correct every time we call a blood test positive that the patient actually does have cancer. And that's really what we're testing in this clinical trial. So here's for, for Tim. Can the S-Wave technology be used to provide a 3D render of the body or an organ? Yes, it can. Uh, basically, um, uh, the question is, is there really an interest in doing that? Because typically, you're focused on a specific organ. So. Um, uh, the problem is that ultrasound doesn't go through air, so we can't really image lungs. And uh, there are MRI techniques that uh, we have some contribution towards that uh, can be used for that case, but not with ultrasound, and not that easy to do at point of care. All right, this is a sort of a general question that any of you can answer. Um, the question is, uh, as researchers, do you feel that you are the best person to lead your company uh, as CEO, or when would you take on another role and hire somebody else to build out your team? <laughs> That's a real question from the audience. <laughs> do, do you want me to answer that? Any, any, I, any yeah. you can. I'll answer that because we did. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm, I'm a science guy. I'm not uh, experienced in business. Um, I've never taken on the role of CEO. I think I call myself president and chief science officer still. We don't have a CEO at Boreal. Um, some years ago, when we raised one of our first financing rounds, uh, the board asked me what I wanted to do in that respect, and I said, let's hire a professional CEO. Um, it turns out, first of all, it's extraordinarily expensive. <laughs> <laughs> you run into this problem that because we don't quite have this ecosystem of biotech in Vancouver, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some great biotech, but in the tool space, which is where I operate, there's not a lot of companies. We have to look to California for a CEO which meant moving uh, a good fraction of the company to California for some period of time. Um, for a company that's doing technology development, that was extraordinarily expensive. 
So we ultimately regrouped here in Vancouver, and I'm running the company again. It's, you know, the, the short answer to your question is sometimes the founders of the company, because we're the most passionate people about the technology, about the company, I uh, think often we are the right people to lead it. Uh, and then you bring an expertise above that. So I have a board of directors, I have advisors that help us on the business front. Um, but ultimately, we're a very, very tightly knit team that work better uh, together as opposed to having an external CEO driving us. Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm really not trained to be a CEO. I think I can help and I can give advice, but we were lucky enough at Sonic Insights uh, to hook up with uh, George Aliftiras, who has a lot of experience in the biomedical uh, field. Uh, and uh, he has been mentoring us through uh, E at UBC for the last uh, year and some. And definitely you can see there's very uh, focused approach to the business side uh, that really does require training and experience. And I'm not quite ready to quit my job. I love what I do at UBC, so uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not a researcher, uh, and I'm not trained to be a CEO either. It's just kind of what happened to, as Andre said, you know, being the, the most passionate. I think Paul and I probably fight for that title, but the most passionate about this technology and the ones who want to bring it forward is really uh, what's required to, to run the company. And then you can bring on advisors, and you can hire the researchers, and you can hire the experts in certain areas. Um, or they can become advisors and work for free um, <laughs> when you're building your company. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, this is, this is the, the title I hold now because that's the, what's, um, what will help us grow through this stage. And if we do have to uh, find someone else to take over, then that will happen as long as, um, you know, the work that we're doing continues and, and we continue to make a difference. A lot of the questions have to do with uh, how they as alumni or as uh, interested investors, how can they directly help each of you? This is a very select, motivated group of individuals that are interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. How can they help you? Um, <laughs> great question. Uh, I mean, as alumni, really, and interested investors, I guess, what's, what's really useful is, uh, is your network and, um, and being able to see, you know, if we have a one certain thing that we're struggling with, whether that's how we structure our database or what's our go-to-market strategy or something like that, being able to plug into those, uh, those areas and, um, and support us in that way. Uh, one, one challenge is, is kind of when there's too many people trying to help, you really have to select which, which, uh, which people kind of can help guide you in the best way in certain areas. So um, we appreciate your enthusiasm and, and sharing it is really useful. How about you two? You two, three. Um, the, how can they help? You know, yeah, I, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's just we had so much help from the local community when we started Boreal. Yeah. And because of the lack of expertise, I mean, in fact, it was a CEO in a company downtown that actually helped us start the company as a UBC alum and, and, and actually he was involved with UILO and you know, has been involved with uh, entrepreneurship at UBC. Um, at the stage we're at now, I mean, we have, we have big name investors, we have a fair amount of money. Uh, we're okay in that sense. I think the help that we need as I see it, particularly wearing my other hat of director of engineering physics, our students need help. It's the next generation. It's the students that are coming out of our programs now, like Andrea, that are starting companies you know, help at that stage. We're spinning off almost one company a year out of engineering physics now, and it, it, it's you know, it's young people that don't have funds, uh, that don't have spaces to work, and that don't have business expertise. <laughs> um, right? Uh, that need mentorship, and you know, there's those of us in the community that have some level of business expertise, um, contributing the way. Um, that people contributed to us when we started is, is brilliant. I mean, we didn't, people didn't ask for money, they just came and helped us, um, you know, both as investors but also as mentors, and I think, uh, I think that's fantastic. We need more of that. Yeah, no, I, I would say, um, you know, the biggest thing is to think about the investment opportunities in Canadian biotechnology. So we all represent different types of Canadian biotechnology, and, and the Canadian investor environment has been traditionally more conservative. It's, you know, 
if you can dig a hole in the ground and get a profit from that, then that's, that's good. But I think <laughs> we really need to think about those investments as, as not only uh, investments that will return to those uh, uh, economically, but also that feed back into the health, Canadian healthcare system and, and bring value in other types of ways as well. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a, a really good opportunity for life sciences investment in Canada. And, you know, I would be strongly supportive of that. Thank you. Here's the last question, and this is uh, personalized, but it, I think it probably holds true for all of you. It says, Tim, you were my best professor at UBC. <laughs> I learned so much from you. How does it feel? How does it feel? Thank you. That's great. Thank you. How does it feel to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur now? Uh, Hannah, you didn't send that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it feels great, uh, there's a lot of learning, we have a very good team and uh, I actually do want to go back to your previous question. We are looking for investors and we are looking for help, so please do contact me or George or Rob about it. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's something new for, for me and I really, um, uh, I really appreciate the time that George and Rob are putting into it. I think that if we didn't have this, this team, um, our technology would sort of just slowly vanish away, so uh, I'm very happy about that. Well, wonderful. Well, there's no better testimony than having someone say you were the best teacher at UBC. Well, thank you. Thank I want to thank all of the presenters for sharing their stories. I just want to give you an idea of what's happening at UBC. I understand this is an annual event, and every year the crowd gets larger and larger. It used to be held in a place that held about 100 and then 200, and now 600 and 700. Before you know it, maybe we'll be filling out, B, we'll fill up BC Place with people interested <laughs> in innovation. Let's give the presenters a round of applause.